Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Anarchist Podcast. This is episode number seven. And in this episode, we are going to talk about Bitcoin, the money supply, economics. We're going to talk about banking, all that kind of stuff. Because if you follow the money, we can get to the root of a lot of the problems. So let's delve into the money. And in and, and starting this podcast, I'm going to make the bold statement by saying Bitcoins can literally end war and save lives. And I'm hoping by the end of this podcast, that bold statement that I just made, you'll be able to make it too. Because I truly believe it. I truly believe that Bitcoins can literally end wars and save lives if pe- if people simply adopted them as their main currency and get off the fiat money supply. And also in this, this, this podcast, I want to try and offer up something new to the Liberty Movement. Because a lot of the things I talk about in, in these podcasts leading up, uh, you know, have been hashed out already in the Liberty Movement. A lot of solutions have been offered up. We, we've, you know, I'm speaking now to my already uh, awoken intellectuals who are already realizing the ideas of anarchy, libertarianism, and stuff like that. If you're just new to the podcast and just new to this stuff now and you are a supporter of government, this may be a little over your head, but bear with me. Maybe by the end of the episode you'll be agreeing with me. But I'm speaking to my guys that are already awake and already know what I'm talking about. We understand that government's uh, a violent and coercive uh, monopoly on... on, on vo- uh, it's just a monopoly on violence and coercion, is what I'm trying to say. We understand that all that begins with taxation. That's how government is birthed. It's a people claiming the right to initiate violence and coercion, to take your money, to take your property, and to take your basically take your shit... And spread it out and give it to other people's shit and give you some services in return. And people understand that this is why government services are shit and why the free market is the best. This is why the free market continues to get better. Prices continue to go down the free market. Ingenuity. Things get better. But government services continue to get shitty and they seem to be stuck in the stone ages. You know, just look comparative. Let's let's take scores from public school kids, uh, and let's take uh, uh, test scores from private school kids. Private school kids score higher always than the public school kids. Let's go. Let's go to a doctor's office that you pay for your surgery, or go down to your local uh, free healthcare and see which one is better service, which one takes longer, and all that kind of stuff. I know here in Socialist Canada. There's a six to nine hour wait time just to see a doctor. And there's not even, there's no option of having a doctor somewhere else that could say, hey, I'll charge this much and you can skip that nine hour wait time and I'll offer the service for this such amount of money. That's illegal. Which is crazy. People would say, oh, well, the rich people would just go to pay for it instead of waiting the nine hours. Yeah, shouldn't they have that option? This is sick that people would deny people that option. But yeah, I'm speaking to my people that are already awake. So we realize we've hashed it upon. We, you know, people, the the move, the solutions I've seen offered up in the movement are a bunch of libertarians and anarchists. All we got to move together in one area, and basically defend our ide- ideology, and try and birth. Uh, a, a volunteer society from that there's also solutions offered up of starting floating cities in the ocean because there's no countries out there and trying to birth a volunteer society out there to show statism how uh, a volunteer society is way better than a course of governments or structured society that we have today and anarchists and stuff like that we're not calling for an abolishment of things like roads and court systems and laws and stuff like that all that we're saying is those services should be offered in Ways that are voluntary and people are paying for those services in a voluntary manner instead of a coercive and forceful one. That's it. 
and I hate that misconception that statism and statists think that anarchists and libertarians just want to get rid of the government and there'll just be this power vacuum. No, there will not be a power vacuum. The free market will fill the power vacuum and the power vacuum will be filled with better services and products because they're being offered in voluntary interactions. We know that human uh, human beings work better uh, when and and, are, uh, and create more wealth and, and create more ingenuity and inventions when we cooperate than when we're fighting with each other. We know these things. So voluntary cooperation is always going to trump forceful and violent cooperation. And, the, and that's what the free market is compared to government. So, like I was saying, so we've there's been solutions offered up. We all got to move together and protect our ideology and start an anarchist utopia. There's been solutions. Well, we got to uh, build a floating city and, and same type of concept. Start there. There's been ideas. Well, we got to all run for office and take the government down from the inside. There's been uh, solutions offered out there, uh, violent ones, which I do not support. There's been all kinds of, uh, of solutions offered up, and I feel today in this podcast I can offer up another one, something new, because I, I hate always, and I'm, I like doing it, you know, it's, it, and it's, it's entertainment in a sense, and people will listen to me simply for me giving my perspective and my spin on these uh, concepts and ideas and all these things that we're talking about in these podcasts, that's cool, but I also feel like I want to give something new. That I don't want to be that guy in the liberty movement that just is repeating every other, every other people's ideas and stuff like that. So, and maybe the thing I'm talking about and what I'll get into, my idea, has already been suggested. So, and then who cares? And I guess whatever, I've got nothing new, but I'll continue to think uh, and try and find new solutions. But before we get into my new solution, we got to do some back history of Bitcoin and money. Because that's what we're going to get into tonight. Banks, Bitcoin, money, all that kind of stuff. And how Bitcoin, like I said, will end wars and save lives. First off, let's, let's, just, go, let's, let's just look at the comparison compared to uh, uh, Bitcoin versus banks. It's obviously the superior banking and financial technology. Now, why, why so? Well, let me just preface that you can, a Bitcoin, uh, with Bitcoins, your cell phone is your bank, basically. You, you don't have to leave your house, drive down to your local bank, and set up a bank, or I guess you could set up a PayPal, it's another type of bank, but basically we're going to be comparing today in this podcast banks to Bitcoin, so you can sit in your house on your cell phone and open up a wallet, which is a vault like a bank. So your cell phone is a bank. You don't have to leave your house. You don't have to drive down to the bank and fill out all their forms and pay their annual fee or if there is no annual fee. But still, so immediately there, it's superior by, it's more convenient. You can set up a bank in your house. You don't have to leave your house. Would just waste time and gas, money and resources to do so. So there it's superior than banks. The second reason why is you can set up a Bitcoin bank account, a Bitcoin wallet, literally within like 30 seconds, maybe less. And in setting up that Bitcoin wallet, it requires less personal information than driving out of your house and going to set up one at the local bank, which people do. Majority of people today deal with banks, less people deal with Bitcoin. So I'm, I'm going to sell this to you guys today, why, why you should be doing Bitcoin and not Federal Reserve notes. Why not paper money? So here you've got a service that you can literally set up in your house in 30 seconds free with no with hardly any information give personal information given an email address and a name and a name could be fake when you go set up uh, a bank account at your local bank 
they're going to want a bunch of information about you, a bunch of personal details. It's going to take more than 30 seconds. And like I said, you're going to have to leave your house to do so. Not to mention, most bank accounts come with a fee. So, like, I'm not even done yet, but here's already, like, two or three, four or five things here that make Bitcoin wallets superior to setting up a bank account at your local bank. Let's continue, though. Banks are all about their fees. Annual fee this, transfer fee that, which you do not have with Bitcoin. Bitcoin does charge a fee when you transfer Bitcoins to each other, but it is so small compared to banks, it's almost unnoticeable. There are billions, billions upon billions of dollars sent around the world each year could be from businesses sending to other businesses globally, could be from rich people sending to rich people globally. It could just be simply from poor people, foreigners coming, moving to uh, other countries and sending their m money they're making here in the other country back to their poor family members that the country they left. Okay, so there's billions and billions of dollars transferred around the planet each year. And in doing so, banks charge fees on that and wire transfer fees. So like I just said, there are billions of dollars each year that is transferred around the world that is charged 2, 3, 4, 5 and up percent margins of fees to transfer that money. By simply those people switching to bitcoins to transfer their money around the world, they sim they eliminate that 2 to 5 to whatever percent fee completely gone. You literally save money. Bitcoin, you can transfer a million dollars in a Bitcoin wallet to another person on the other side of the world into their Bitcoin, one million, bang, bang, into the wallet almost instantaneously with an, 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 an super, super small fee to that. Now, if you were to try and transfer a million dollars through your local bank to another bank, a guy, that guy with his bank on the other, they're going to they're gonna charge you a pretty big wire transfer fee for that. You eliminate that fee by, by by doing it through Bitcoin. Not to mention holds. Oh, don't we all hate bank holds? Why is it that when we deposit a check or when you deposit money, banks have these holds? Well, we got to do a five-day hold to verify. There's no such thing as holds with Bitcoins. So completely, all that the problem that people always bring up, I uh, hate that banks are controlling our It's our fucking money. And they're telling me that I got a couple day hold on it, on my check or on my whatever. All that problem be eliminated with Bitcoins. Okay, so like, this is why I am so excited about Bitcoin because I know from personal experience, because I've worked with some foreigners who send their money that they get here back to their poor families if those people knew that they could literally save that transfer fee money and put that extra transfer fee money back into their own pockets or give it back to the poor people that that is empowering so much people and putting that money back into their their wallets and I know because who doesn't want to save money People, obviously, if you say, hey, you want to save money, who's going to tell you no? So the minute that all these people, all these foreigners realized that they can send their money back to their family in their other countries, which I don't, I'm not going to get into whether I agree or don't agree with, but once they realize that they can do that and not pay that fee, they're going to be jumping all over Bitcoin. They just don't know right yet because Bitcoin's so new. People don't really know about Bitcoin yet. It's like it's like the internet in 1992. <laughs> it hasn't caught on yet. People don't realize the the true potential of this this uh, beautiful thing. 
So when all these foreigners realize, and all these people that transfer money realize that, hey, I can avoid wire transfer fees, boom, people are going to start adopting Bitcoin. Because you simply save money. Not to mention, this is not a plug. I'm not sponsored by these people, although, hey, you're more than welcome to take sponsors. But Purse.io is a service that if you buy things off Amazon in Bitcoin, they'll give it to you because you're buying with Bitcoin at a 15 and up to 25% discount. So literally, if you buy with Bitcoin, you save money. When people realize that they can go on Amazon and save 10, 15, 25% off their purchases by simply purchasing with Bitcoin, who's not going to do that? Who's not going to want to save 10, 20, 40, or no, 10 to 25, whatever percentage? Who's not going to want to do that? So I know all these things are going to catch on when people realize them because obviously if you ask any person on the street if they could save money, they always try and find ways to do so. And Bitcoin is a way to do so. A couple years ago, a lot of people, a uh, major problem they had with Bitcoin is, well, if I get Bitcoin, what can I do with it? Nobody, and that was an issue. Nobody, what can I what can I buy with my Bitcoin? But now today, in just a couple years, Dell, Microsoft, Expedia, and so many more, hotels, people even sell cars now, in Bitcoin. So this, in two years, we went from people, what the hell do I buy with my Bitcoin? The actual first thing was bought with Bitcoin was, I think, a pizza. But people a couple years ago, what the hell can I buy with my Bitcoin to? Two years, big major companies taking it. So what's that forecast to project for me? The next two years, even more companies will be taking it. Because they'll realize the things that I just told you. That you eliminate interest fees. You eliminate wire transfer fees, annual fees. All these fees that money and banks make their money off of. And who's not going to want to save money? It's common sense. There's also things like Bitcoin credit cards that are already being made. So this stuff is happening and it's happening quick. And <laughs> here's another reason why people should be thinking about getting in with Bitcoin. And why I really want to get in Bitcoin don't really have the as much resources or money right now to throw down and buy a bunch but I'm gonna leave my Bitcoin address in the in the de the description because I will be accepting Bitcoin donations because I want to get me some Bitcoin because I think these things are going up they're about 250 or whatever so a pop right now for per Bitcoin but let's do the math there's only going to be ever in existence 21 million Bitcoin. It's all that can be ever uh, made, which is also why it's superior than the paper money, because paper money can be printed. Like I said, uh, gold, hard to get. You can't just print print gold. you got to go mine that out of the ground. It takes money, time, men to do so, whereas it's a lot easier to print out paper money so even better than gold because gold you can still go mine some more to the ground but Bitcoin only 21 million in existence ever will be in existence there are billions of people on the planet so when those billions of people wake up and realize that hey I can transfer money to my loved ones I can buy shit off Amazon I can I can have a bank account that has no annual fee. I can avoid five day holds. I can avoid wire transfer fees. I can avoid all these other things. I can avoid giving the the bank my all this personal information because now privacy is a major concern on the forefront. People are going to be like, oh my god, it's clearly the most superior banking thing. They're going to eat it up. There's billions of people on the planet, 21 million in existence. Do the dumbers. Bitcoins could go up to, right now they're 250 each, they could go up to 2,500 each. They could go up to 25,000 each. The, the number is, can go very high because, like I said, 21 million cap with billions of people on the planet. So there's a lot of room to make money here. 
for early adopters. Another thing that boggles my mind is the fact that a bank can lend out more than they have in their holdings. And I don't think many people know that. It's definitely not taught to you in school, in government-run uh, schools. And it's crazy that that, is, that that is not talked about ever. It's like the unspoken secret that nobody ever wants to talk about. That a bank can literally, in some cases, five and, and even upwards of eight times their holdings. So let me give you an example of this. Right now, there are banks around the world that let's say have $100,000 real cash of customers giving them, all, and it all adds up to $100,000 in their vault. They're lending out five to 800000 when they only actually have 100000 real in there. So that an extra, let's say they're lending out five times their reserves. So they have 100000 in the bank, hired asset. They're lending out 500000 worth. There's 400000 that's completely made up and of those four hundred thousand, they're giving out microtransactions, micro loans, and everything, and they're charging fees on all that. They're making cash off of the four hundred thousand in fees and interest, and it's completely fraudulent, made-up money. And that—that's how our banking system's set up. And then banks have the nerve, you know, to to say people are, are fraudsters. Like literally, banks banking today. Banksters are some of the biggest frauders on the planet. Because how can you... That is in itself a fraud. You are lending out money you physically don't own. It's crazy that, that, that that's even a law. It's crazy that that even happens. It's crazy that nobody hardly knows that. Like, that is criminal activity. To be able to have 100000 in the vault... And lend out five hundred thousand, <laughs> so, and then this is why what we happen, why banks do the when Cyprus or when there's any kind of e economic meltdown or natural disaster or anything where people think that or the the banks think that people are going to want to go and be like, hey, well, I need my money right now. That's why the banks always shut their doors because they're scared of a crash. They're scared of a run on the banks, as they call it, because they know that if every single person went and took what they are supposed to have in the bank. That they're lending out more than the reserves that the bank would crash. They don't have the money to give people. They'd be gone. They're like, sorry guys, there's no money. <laughs> but it's, like, it's so crazy. And how is it? Here's another thing that I find extremely crazy. As an individual, there's only so much you can run your debt up. There's only so bad your credit score can be. Before people start saying, sorry, we're not giving you more credit. Sorry, we're not giving you a, a, a loan. Sorry, we're not giving you a new credit card. There's only so long you cannot pay your phone bill or your internet bill or whatever the case may be before they shut it off. But government debt seems to have no limit. <laughs> like, why is that? I find that extremely crazy that the debt can even get to a point of $18 trillion. Shouldn't have we, we as a society, the minute the 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 budget started going in the red and not the black, well, that's the whole problem with government. They don't create wealth; they steal it, and that's why governments are shit. But like, when when it got to like one trillion in debt, or no, no, no let's let's even go even lower. When it got to one a, a million dollars, why weren't people being like, "Holy shit, guys!" Like, you know. I go over a couple thousand, or I don't pay my bills, I don't get another loan, or I can't, you know, I can't, you know, we shut that shit down. But yeah, with government, they're like, oh, well, we're a million in debt, but it's all right, we're going to go to a billion in debt. And then they went to a billion in debt to, now we're up to 18 trillion. When does it stop? When do people, when do the people realize that, hey, wait, obviously these people aren't financially responsible with our money. Because they've literally gotten it to a point where we're eighteen trillion dollars in the red. That's some serious financial irresponsibility. 
They didn't cut them off. They didn't cut. They didn't cut the government. They're like, hey. Like these these other countries, I love it too that China and these other people still loan money to the U.S. It's like, <laughs> what's the U.S.'s credit score if it could have one? And you're fucking loaning these people. Well, they did. Their their debt is, uh, like Bernie Sanders, literally wants to add like the debt is 18 trillion now. He wants to it, like double it. Who the fuck is giving the U.S. 18 more trillion dollars to pay for all of Bernie Sanders' freebies? When they look at the track record of the U.S. and they're like, well, clearly they can't even pay the 18 trillion they they owe now, and <laughs> we're gonna give these guys another 18 trillion. But see, the reason why they can do that is the government just goes to the these printing machines, the bank machines, and they just say, well, nobody will loan it to us when we need it. Print it, and that's what we call. Um, stimulating the economy they call it uh, qe1 quantitative easing they're fucking printing money out of thin air they call it quantitative quantitative easing <laughs> and these people have like high educations and they in banking and economics and this is what they're talking about these fancy words dude you're printing fucking money out of thin air you're fraud you're fraud it's not it's not <laughs> quantitative easing <laughs> stimulating the economy now you're you're inflating the economy you're creating inflation in the currency obviously if you just print shit out of thin air and double the supply obviously it's not if you have a a million uh, 18 or a million dollars and you just print another million dollars you didn't now have two million dollars you made that million dollars worth 500k like it, it doesn't work like that guys it's not how economics works and like i was saying Bernie saying like we we literally just elected in Canada communist socialist Justin Trudeau whose platform that he ran on unlike the other ones was like we're not even going to look at the debt <laughs> for like 4 or 5 years <laughs> we're not even going to look at it he was like well you know we'll, we'll we'll budget the balance in like 5 years or something Budget the balance in five years. Can you tell your, uh, can you tell when, uh, when you, you stop paying your phone bill, it's like, yeah, I'll pay it in five years. I'll get to it. Right now I'm going to invest in some house, uh, renovations. Trying to stimulate jobs. <laughs> was, sorry, I can't pay my phone bill. And the guy in the before, oh, okay, that's all right. We'll, we'll call back in five years. No! What do you mean you're going to balance the budget, Justin, in five or four years? Balancing the budget should be a fucking issue you do right away, and it should be, like... But the government has no incentive of balancing the budget, because they can't. They're not in to make a revenue surplus. They just, they just want to give people free shit. All the government does is take shit, take shit from the people... Give it to the poor people because there's more poor people than there are rich people, obviously. So all government is, what I see it is, an institution that poor people use to steal the money from the rich people, to dispute it, to, to, to give it back out to the poor people, and those people who stole the money take a big, huge cut in the middle. They're like the middleman. These are your corrupt politicians and all that stuff. That's all it is. It's a big Ponzi scheme, the government. The whole institution. It's ridiculous. I mean, war is fucking expensive. You ever go look up the price? I don't encourage you to because you probably get flagged on the NSA, but just, I mean, just look at the price of some of these military hardware. How much? I wonder how much a tank costs in Iraq. I wonder how much those bombs that they drop on those, those children in Syria or even Taliban. I wonder how much each one of those drop, bombs they drop costs. War is fucking expensive. Okay. So how the hell are they able to wage it? How is a country that clearly can't pay their bills, clearly has a credit score that's so low it's in the fucking gutters, and can somehow still get loans from other countries, and can still drop bombs? They, these people can't fucking balance the budget, but they can drop bombs at whatever, how much, hundred thousands or million dollars worth of bombs a day. Or, how, or you know, the wars cost trillion dollars or something in the U.S., the Iraq War, some couple trillion dollars. 
how were they able to do that? Wars are only able to be waged because of the money supply, because of the debt slavery the government creates. Because the government can say, all right, we want to go to war with Syria, which Canada just are pulling out now or whatever, but they're still doing some... Don't think it's a total pullout. It's just a... They'll just call it under the gaze of humanitarian aid, but they'll secretly be in there. But let's use the U.S. as an example. They're waging war every day, which is costing them billions upon billions of whatever a day. And they can't pay their budget. How are they able to do that? How are they able to wage wars when they're broke? They're literally just stacking it, that debt stacking all the billions of dollars they're spending today to the national debt which gets stacked on to future generations of unborn children it's fraud it's criminal activity it, i can't believe that this is the system we've learned to accept wars only able to be waged because of the fiat fed run money supply and the ability to print money and to stack it to the debt without that it couldn't because imagine if they actually said to the u.s okay we want to or in canada when they wanted to go to war with syria okay we're going to war with syria but in order to pay for all this war we have to raise your taxes people would freak the fuck out because we already hate war people would, people would, no you're not raising our taxes to go to war we don't want to go to war in the first place Especially we don't want to have our taxes raised are high enough as it is. So the wars would be obsolete if they had to address it that way. So the only way they can get away with war is by saying, all right, we can't stick them with anything now because they'll get pissed at us. Stick it to the unborn children. Stick it to the national debt. Make them pay for it uh, generations down the road. That's fucking criminal. And I can't believe that that's, that's accepted. And widely how, widely how the system's set up. Now, another reason why Bitcoin is superior than banking is there's no such thing as fucking bail, bail-ins, and banks can't just steal your shit. Like I said, when something goes wrong, when the economy crashes, when all this trillions of debt, when the when the money, when the loan man finally realizes that hey, I'm not we're not giving no more loans, we're done, or when this shit finally hits the fan. Or we hit hyperinflation, you can only go so far in a debt. You know, you can't, 18 trillion, 100 trillion, like at some point in time it will crash. It's ine inevitable. And when that time comes, and the banks close the doors and they do bank balance, what we've seen in Cyprus, they where the banks crash, they couldn't pay the debt because Cyprus and that, they can't print their money like the states. So the, the people like the other countries like, hey, nope, you better pay the fucking debt. We want our, we're coming, we want our money now. So what do they do? They're like, well, sorry, population, the guys want their money. We can't print any paper currency like the other nations. So we need to take a haircut, 30% off of everyone's bank accounts to pay for this debt. People had no say in that. People couldn't run down and be like, whoa, I don't want to take that. I don't, you're not taking my 30%. They fucking locked the banks. They closed the doors, and they did it. They did it, and they got away with it. And they just stole 30% off people's bank accounts. And they have it written, if you type into Google, Canadian bank balance, it has been written into our code, into our Canadian law. So why the fuck would they write Canadian bank balance? Governments never write anything that they don't plan to use. Oh, we're just going to write this in here, just in case. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. We know why they wrote it in there. Because at some point in time, they plan on implementing it here in Canada. At some point in time, Canadians' debt will have to be paid. At some point in time, our economy will crash. Because we're not making money as a nation. We're losing money. We're not in the red. Or we're not in the black. We're in the red. At some point in time, that'll catch up to us. At some point in time, they'll try and do this haircut shit. 
And when they do that, if you have your money in a Bitcoin wallet, they can't take your money. Or even when there's like a natural disaster and people like like an earthquake or something that hits, people want to run down to the banks because they want to buy and stock up on maybe the necessity supplies, maybe the power's out for a week or something. Any, like anything like that, natural disasters, economic meltdowns, all these situations, the banks just close, all, they always close their doors. And they're like, too fucking bad, you can't get your shit. Can you imagine that'd be equivalent to storing um, your stuff at a storage locker, that storage locker going bankrupt, not being able to pay, pay the, keep the lights on, going bankrupt, and then it just saying, too bad, we're keeping your shit. No, you'd be able to sue the storage locking company. Who cares if they went bank? You'd be able to sue them and say, no, you can't just you can't just steal my shit. How come Cyprus taxpayers cannot sue the Cyprus banks and say, you can't steal 30% of our money? You can't just do that. But they did it anyway. And all this would be eliminated with Bitcoin. And this is where I'm going to get into my stance or how I'm going to back up how I think Bitcoin can end war because if everyone was using Bitcoin then they couldn't fund the wars it'd be too expensive you can't just print Bitcoins and here's where I get into my solution what I think I can offer new to the liberty movement what I think about what I think hasn't really been discussed yet so Bitcoin, Bitcoin is not only just digital currency. And I'm going to use a, a quote from Anth Andre and uh, Andreas Antonopoulos. What's his name? Sorry, I'm try, trying to stumble out, trying to say his word there. Andreas Antonopoulos. He said it very eloquently. He said Bitcoin is like the internet in 1992 people thought it was just for email little did they know the internet today would be a lot more than just for fucking email as you see so bitcoin is not only digital currency the blockchain the technology it uses has massive massive benefits and, and ways of using that technology besides just the digital currency. And this is where I'm going to get into my solution. And what I see, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Because status always make the argument. How are we going to fund roads? How are we going to fund? Because there are things as a civilized society that you will need to have funded. Such as courts roads um, even let's say education in some sense all these basic necessities that government supposedly provides the things that we want to you know we want to give to people the people should have or whatever but the problem with that is is we see when we let government do it, they take a fucking huge cut, the middleman, they fuck everything up, they don't disperse it how we want, exactly want them, they spend it other, other ways. But why do we not offer a solution as using the Bitcoin blockchain as a way of structuring a voluntary society? So think of this, a voluntary society that sets up funding of mass services on a blockchain type fund me thing so you would go to a website let's say you lived in a community and you need to pay for roads or whatever the case may be you need to pay for the courts or whatever you would send your money through this bitcoin through through the bitcoin blockchain and because the Bitcoin blockchain has no central authority, no monopoly, you send your money 
into the Bitcoin blockchain and the blockchain then would disperse it to the people for those services. So basically eliminating the platform of government with blockchains. No, like, okay, I'm trying. It sounded a lot better in my head, but let me try and get this out of how I, I, I imagine this working. So basically, the blockchain technology is to set up is to get rid of the center monopoly and to give 100% even accountability to money disbursement. So like everyone can everyone goes and files their taxes every year. We already do that. So instead of filing your taxes, you filed your taxes through Bitcoin blockchains. So you would file your taxes, okay, here's the amount of money that needs to go to courts to give everyone the basic uh, court system. Here's the money that goes to healthcare to give everyone a basic health care. Here's the money. So you would you would go to, like you file your taxes, you'd have a, like a voluntarily checkbox and you'd be able to choose which, which services you wanted to buy. And in doing so, when you sent that money, it would be sent through the blockchain technology, which would make sure it got dispersed correctly to the people who it's supposed to be. So the Blick, Blick, by sending that money in, the blockchain then could disperse it individually to that judge you're paying for the court services, to the judge or, or to the court reporter, to the prosecutor, to whatever, all the other people going to the healthcare, to the nurse, to this, to the medications, blah, 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 blah. It, the blockchain technology would make sure that the money got dispersed evenly and accountable unlike the way we send our money taxes, f fill our tax forms and send it to the government and hope that they disperse it how we want to evenly and, and all and such and so, but no, they don't do that. They take a cut. Like here's another example. The welfare system is an example. Cause what about the poor people? Well, here's the crazy thing about the welfare system. You send in money to give to the poor in in Canada, I think it's six hundred and twenty six dollars you get in Ontario or something. So the poor person gets six hundred and twenty six dollars a month or something on his welfare check. But the person that gives him the welfare check, the government lady working behind the desk, makes like ninety hundred thousand dollars a year. It's crazy that, like, where the welfare system is supposed to help the poor, but all those employers don't need to be there. You don't need to be there to hand someone a welfare check if you want to help the poor. That that social worker, you'd eliminate her job by having a welfare system set up on the Bitcoin blockchain. The money would then directly get to the poor. So you could literally go to www.wewantawelfare.com. If, if people are like, well, we care about the poor. We care. We'll make sure every, just like you file your taxes every year, make sure you file your welfare every year to make sure to help these poor people out. And the blockchain technology then would disperse it to the individuals who would need it, who could sign up on the website as well. You know, the website could offer you uh, need a photo ID or whatever kind of information, but you would eliminate that social worker who's making 90 or whatever, 100 grand a year to give the poor person 626 a month. It seems like a very uh, shitty system. If you really want to help the poor, that doesn't seem like the best way to do so. It seems like government just creating jobs for themselves. So I don't know, I just see on a grand wide scale Bitcoin blockchains being used as a way of dispersing money, collecting and dispersing money without any central monopoly. Because that's the problem. When you have an agency that disperses 
money, money corrupts people. And you got to worry when you give money to a, 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 a certain person that it gets spent and sent and sent to the people it's supposed to go and are spent the right way. Whereas the Bitcoin blockchain technology has no central authority figure. There's nobody running it. I don't know if this is making any sense to you guys. But <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It's just me ranting and thinking of how I think these things could work. Because obviously... There are those that believe that we should still, you know, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to see, I'm a capitalist. I believe that the free market and just leaving the free market to be would be the ultimate solution. But I'm trying to sympathize and I know I shouldn't be, but I'm trying to sympathize with the socialist, with the person who thinks, well, I think everybody should have free, a right to free health care because, you know, it's not right if someone's simply poor should die. You know, that's not really good, although it's not good, but, you know, tragic situation. And so how is it that these poor people then, these rich people, or the people that want to help the poor, can do so in a way that they make sure that the poor actually get the money and eliminate the middleman? So we see in charities too. Charities like Red Cross. What about having a Bitcoin blockchain based charity? Because a charity, even like Red Cross or something, or even nice charities that supposedly give 70% of what's sent in in donations to the poor and they keep 30% as an overhead. Now, there are terrible charities that are way worse than that, that they keep like 50%, give actual 50% to the poor. There's even some that keep 70% of your money you'd send in actually 30% gets the poor well why not why have we why even pay 1% if the whole idea is to donate to the poor we don't want to have a very high overhead we just want to get the money right into the poor's hands so if we had a red car across website a Red Cross type system that helps the poor, but we used it with a blockchain backing technology, and all those poor people would simply have to have access to a cell phone, then it's a way that we could eliminate that 20, 30, 40, whatever percent overhead of having the building, of having the lights, of having the employees, and all the other things, when simply you just want to give some poor people some money because you think they shouldn't be starving in Africa. Well, you could do donation-based systems off the blockchain that way to ensure that the money actually gets to the poor. And I don't know, I see this blockchain like Ant and Andreas and Antonopoulos said in 1992, you thought the internet was just about email and people think that the blockchain or the blockchain is just about digital cash when it's not it's a, it's about much more, it's about a technology that can disperse money with no central monopoly and that is that is that is that is a, that is a beautiful technology because money corrupts and usually when you give money to a central authority it it's shit gets fuckery well, Bitcoin eliminates that. Eliminates the monopoly. Eliminates the one person. And if the same way we filed taxes, we filed taxes through Bitcoin blockchains that were published on public ledgers, which also, why isn't it that we can't see how much our government employees spend on things? Because government's the biggest waster on the planet. For instance, like let's say you got a government office and they want to order new pens for the government office. Does that government office buy the cheapest pens to make sure the businesses keep... Or do they just buy whatever? Because it's taxpayer dollars and don't give a fuck. That's usually what the case is. Usually these politicians splooge on, on uh, expensive uh, stuff like that. Fly first class instead of 
whatever, or whatever the case may be. But the point is government waste. And you would eliminate that waste with a blockchain technology to disperse the money. So I don't know if, if that made any sense to you guys <laughs> of what I'm trying to get th past here. Because I'm even still trying to understand it myself. Because it's complicated shit. This Bitcoin platform, this technology, it's complicated, but it's also revolutionary. Once you understand it. And I'm still trying to understand it. And this is why I got so much faith in Bitcoin. Because I'm still trying to understand it. I know sure as hell, the dumbass sheeple, the majority of the public, they don't understand this shit yet. But when they do, just like me, the light bulb will go off and be like, Whoa, I can avoid five-day holds. I can avoid interest rates, wire transfer fees, annual fees. All these other things that banks make their money off of, we can eliminate by switching to Bitcoin. It's like saving money by switching to Geico. I feel like I'm the Geico uh, guy for Bitcoin right now. You can save money by banking with Bitcoin. And it's literally the fucking truth. You can save money by switching to Bitcoin. You can end wars by switching to Bitcoin. Because like I said, if if everyone tomorrow just opened up Bitcoin bank accounts, which is very plausible. This is a plausible idea. If you can get enough people to realize it, and what's the biggest incentive for people? Well, if they can save money, and this is what Bitcoin is doing. They're a technology that's offering you services, the same service that a bank can offer you, at a way better rate and not giving as much personal information. So when the vast majority of people realize this, it will be the superior banking technology. And I think the price will, will go up. I think it will do very well. But it will take time. And we already see it happening though. Like, uh, like I said, a lot more businesses taking it now than ever before. But the real magic definitely is the technology behind the digital currency Bitcoin. That ability to disperse or to transfer money with no central monopoly. That's key. And maybe you could structure a volunteer society by setting up services using the blockchain technology to take in the donations or the money for the services and the blockchain technology disperses that money to the rightful employees and stuff like that or the rightful products I don't know I just see it being a way more fluid way of getting stuff done and paid for I don't know. I'm going to wrap this podcast up. We're, we're 50 some minutes in now. We're coming up on the hour. But I don't know what else to say. It's it's hard. To, I'm trying to get it across from you guys. I'm hoping that you guys understand what I'm trying to say. Let me know in the comment section below if it made any sense to you guys. But all the government is like, like all the government is is like, hey, send us your money and we'll make sure we give you roads healthcare, welfare, that all these things that people like to have that government provides. You send us the money, we'll get the job done. I just, uh, my solution is let the big chain, let the blockchain technology of Bitcoin, that technology, offer the same service that government is for their services. So it's like, like I said, government, send us your tax dollars in and we'll, we'll give you, the, we'll make sure you get healthcare, we'll make sure you get roads, we'll make sure, you, we'll send your money into such Bitcoin blockchain ledger and we'll make sure that you get roads, healthcare, and all these other things that the government provides, eliminating that middleman and also eliminating the central monopoly in, in that uh, scenario. So corruption can't happen and it makes sure 100% the technology will feed the money to the rightful situations, to the courts, to the roads, to the healthcare, to the, to the schools, all that stuff. 
in a way more productive and, and accurate manner is what I'm trying to get through here. If you if you get what I'm saying. Because like I see that technology literally filling the gap for what governments do. So I hope you guys understand what I just try to say. And like I said, let me know in the comment section below if any of that made sense. Or did it just go foo over your heads? Some people it will. Some people may get it. Some people may may be able to articulate it better than me because I'm not the best speaker. I'm not the best uh, spokesman for Bitcoin. And maybe if I talked to Anthony or uh, Andreas Antonopoulos and I told him this, he'd be able to spell it out and or say it back to me in such a articulate manner that makes so much more sense than I can get through in this podcast. That's why I'm doing this podcast and throwing that idea out there so that other people can scrutinize that idea and to figure out ways to discuss it in a, in a way that makes more sense to the masses. That, hey, government is just a service saying, or just people saying, well, we want these basic things in the society and we need them. They're necessities, courts and roads and everything. Okay, you're trusting people and in making sure that shit gets done. People make fucking mistakes. Why not trust that decision down to a technology, a robot, an algorithm, who won't be like, hmm, maybe I want to uh, buy those more expensive pens, or oh, maybe I'm a corrupt politician who wants to raise my pay, or oh, I want to go on a, I want to take a nice vacation on the taxpayer. All these things would be fucking eliminated because the algorithm would do it in the most... Uh, productive way human beings make mistakes with money it's why the debt's 18 trillion and everything's gotten so out of hand so if we use the bitcoin blockchain technology as the government money dispersing force you eliminate the coercion it's voluntary plus you eliminate the man and the monopoly who could fuck with it that's what i'm trying to say so i don't know that's where i'm going to wrap this podcast up hope you guys found it informative and like i said at the at the very first of the podcast my quote i started with give me control of a nation's money and i care not who makes the laws rothschild give me control of the nation's money and i not, and i care not who makes its laws well if we get rid of give me control of this nation's money well let's go from to bitcoin and not fiat currency they can't fuck up our laws and this quote is doesn't work no more and then the simplest thing broken down when you read the quote give me control of a nation's money i care not who make the laws because obviously money you can just buy off the people who make the laws and that's what we see happening right now with a bitcoin structure or, or like a, a blockchain society structure blockchain governments thing you can't buy off the bitcoin algorithm like you can a politician to pass laws so there's like the technology can be you can be used that way even for i'm not of course uh, uh, uh someone who's a fan of democracy because all it just means is mob rule but let's say you could get a bunch of intellectuals in a society and you wanted to have truly a nice democratic democracy because you knew most people in that population knew what the fuck they were talking about and they were qualified to vote. Bitcoin, the blockchain technology, is a good way to vote as well. Could be used for voting to make sure that there's no fuckery in the voting because it's a public ledger and all that other good stuff. And there's no monopoly... No people like like it could be used set up that way as well the technology. I don't know, but like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this podcast up. Coming up on the hour. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope it didn't go over your head. Hopefully you guys can understand what I was, the points I was trying to get across. And hopefully people get get high behind Bitcoin. It'll save you guys money. What better sales pitch than that? Here's a product that's gonna save you money. And it'll keep your privacy. Shit, that sounds pretty damn good. 
So save money, switch to Bitcoin, end wars by switching to Bitcoin, save human beings, switch to Bitcoin, 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 Bitcoin. That's what I'm going to end this podcast on. And if I got any people listening out there who want to share some of those yummy, delicious Bitcoin with me, look for my Bitcoin wallet in the description code and send those delicious babies my way. Because I will promote the shit out of them. I'm, I believe them. I know that this is going to work because I, I've just looked at the facts. I've looked and say, hmm, here's the banking structure, what a bank offers. Here's a Bitcoin, which is basically your own personal bank. It's the superior technology. It makes fucking sense to me. You got me. You sold. I'm good. And that's why I want to get some of these things. So send some Bitcoins my way in that Bitcoin wallet. You'll make me one happy guy, one happy anarchist. And I hope, hopefully, grow this uh, podcast to something bigger. Like I said, eventually, I'd like to have guests on, people that I can bounce ideas off of. Eventually, we'll get into, we'll do a video stream as well. Right now, it's just audio. Because it's, it's hard sometimes to upload in video. It's a lot of memory and gigabytes and stuff like that to upload that stuff. It's a bigger, f- and it's a lot easier to do audio. But if this show catches on, if people like what I'm talking about, and I get some support, the Bitcoin start rolling in, I want to turn this podcast into something a lot bigger. With the visual, cameras, like a, like a real nice professional looking podcast. But it takes time, it takes money. And I'm not there yet, but we will get there. And it will take time. And hopefully, people listen to these ideas. Hopefully, people adopt Bitcoin because they realize that they can save money. Save 10, 15, 20% uh, by buying off of Amazon with, with Bitcoin with using purse.io. Hopefully, people realize that they can transfer their money to their families around the world and avoid that transfer fee by switching to Bitcoin. And hopefully people like uh, I did tonight look into the blockchain technology and don't just focus on the digital currency of the blockchain technology. That's only one thing. And like I can't keep quoting it enough because he put it so elegantly. Uh, Antonopoulos. Don't look at Bitcoin as the email in the 1992 in the internet. There's more to it than that. There's more to it. The blockchain's the technology. The blockchain's the real thing behind Bitcoin. And it could be implemented to structure society and eliminate the the thing that government provides, which is we're going to take your money and make sure we give you these services, and they usually don't. But if you send it through a blockchain technology, there's no central monopoly. You eliminate that problem. You eliminate the human fuckery. So I hope you guys enjoyed it and found this uh, podcast informative. And we will see you guys in episode number eight, which I'm not quite sure the topic yet or when exactly that will come out. But stay tuned for that. It will happen very soon. So we'll see you guys in that episode eight. I'm your host for the Anarchist Podcast. Peace.